epistle reading this morning is from 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 2 through 10. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know. But God knows, was caught up to paradise. He heard inexpressible things, things that a man is not permitted to tell. I will boast about a man like that, but I will not boast about myself, except about my weaknesses. Even if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool, because I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain, so no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I do or say. To keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations, there was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. The Gospel is from Mark, chapter 6, verses 1 through 13. Jesus left there and went to his hometown accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. Where did this man get these things, they asked. What's this wisdom that has been given him that he even does miracles? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Jesus said to them, only in his hometown, among his relatives, and in his own house is a prophet without honor. He could, do, he could not do any miracles there, except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed at their lack of faith. Then Jesus went around teaching from village to village. Calling the twelve to him, he sent them out two by two and gave them authority over evil spirits. These were her, his instructions. Take nothing for the journey except a staff. No bread, no bag, no money in your belts. Wear sandals, but not an extra tunic. Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that town. And if any place will not welcome you or listen to you, shake the dust off your feet when you leave as a testimony against them. They went out and preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. The word and gospel of the Lord. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Thank you, Jesus. I have to share with you a uh, really interesting experience Patrice and I had yesterday. Um, yesterday no friday in fact and so uh we went down we had we get emails from vermont prayer force about any events that are going to be happening and uh so one of the in the state of vermont or new hampshire so there was a uh, a revival meeting uh with an invitation in in uh, white river junction and uh, an evangelist coming in from uh, somewhere and uh, tent meeting and everything. So we're certainly looking to connect with other parts of the body of Christ. So we went and <clears throat> we went on for the Friday morning meeting. And so the evangelist uh, 
message was very biblical, very good, and there was a very biblical discussion about what evangel is, evangelism is specifically, and uh, uh, very appropriate, but definitely from an evangelical standpoint. Uh, what is salvation, and what does it look like, and how do you approach people, that sort of thing. And then there was a little bit of a training and then we were uh, dumbfounded <laughs> to uh, realize that we were sent out to do evangelism. And uh, so this put me right out of my comfort area. Uh, and uh, so there I, I was, uh, Patrice and I, and uh, we went out with this gentleman named Don, who was one of the, on the staff of this evangelism and was really quite gifted in evangelism. So here's a question. What do you say? And, and so this is street level evangelism. This is you, you come uh, and you uh, sort of catch up with people. We actually were sent to Dartmouth, to the center square in Dartmouth, and uh, which actually originally was set up as a missionary school for Indian children uh, back in the 1700s. And uh, so we were chasing, just I'm not being totally funny about that, uh, Dartmouth students around the screen uh, trying to get them to talk and so Don who was sort of our coach um, was really very good and so he had a card that a script basically that he read from and so the conversation opened this way hey um, you know God loves you do you know that God loves you and he has a plan for your life and let me ask you this question if uh, you had died yesterday would you be in heaven today and uh, so about half the people said i'm busy don't bother me uh, the other half uh, stopped and engaged our conversation and uh, so really again you can imagine me i'm out of my comfort zone and so the the don who we were with said to the darpa students um, you know, went through the promises of God uh, about uh, being saved and, uh, and then offered to say the prayer of salvation with them if they were to agree. And uh, so it was, would you like, you know, always offered optionally, you know, this is what I'd like to do. Would you like to join me in this prayer? But it was very direct, very gospel oriented, very biblical. And, uh, <clears throat> and so interestingly, several people stopped and engaged us. Uh, one gentleman was uh, already a member of a local church, and uh, do you know God? Yes, I have a personal re saving relationship with Jesus Christ, was his answer. And we're like, oh, yeah. Uh, and, uh, but then there were uh, several students from, I think, Pakistan, maybe, uh, who responded well and said the prayer of salvation with Don and with us. And uh, so we were a combination of things by the different people. There were, we were ignored by some and told to leave by others. But then some stopped. It was like, yeah, you know, engaged us in this conversation and, and everything. And uh, it was really interesting for me because I think of Dartmouth, it's like, you know, uh, highly intellectual people, and very smart, and usually not the type that would like to engage you on a gospel-centered message. And uh, that wasn't true. About half the people that we uh, that we stopped were interested in that conversation. It was a couple of guys playing frisbee that stopped their game uh, briefly and talked to us, for instance. Uh, and Don said that it's his experience that you know between 30 and 50 percent of the people that he initiates the conversation with will actually engage him and that uh, sometimes he finds people that are in the depths of darkness and are just hurting and uh, that uh, you know the, the gospel is just exactly exactly what they need uh, so really interesting uh, cross-cultural experience for me um, not something I, I like, I'm uncomfortable doing it, probably just because of my own uh, c perspective in that uh, uncomfortable feeling is not that it's the wrong thing to do, it's the right thing to do. Uh, but uh, it's, sometimes it's good, I find for me, and especially on Friday, it was good for me to put myself in that position, which is not something I'm used to, and go into a situation which my expectations were all wrong, 
and, uh, and risk that a little bit for the Lord. And it, it turned out really quite well. Then um, we had to, you know, finish up and, uh, but therefore, you know, for an hour or two, Dartmouth was, uh, was the focus of a lot of evangelism work because there were other teams that were there on the green in Dartmouth. And uh, very appropriate, I think, if you know the history of Dartmouth, uh, that goes way, way back, uh, but not necessarily welcomed. Anyways, very interesting. So how do you do it? How do you, and so Don, the guy we were following, just had this knack of putting his face right in front of people and saying, you know, if you were to die today uh, or yesterday, would you be in heaven today? Just like, and not uh, being squeamish about that at all, being very, very willing and, uh, and amazingly, and, and really being quite skilled at uh, engaging people and bringing them through the gospel, through the promises of God and the Bible and inviting them to the camp meeting. And uh, <clears throat> so, but I was thinking, that's a lot. It's kind of like what Jesus did in his Galilean ministry. So he was new, uh, you know, 30 years old. He was a rabbi. He was trained in the word. And uh, he and his disciples would go on a circuit around the Sea of Galilee to all these different villages. And uh, I think several of the disciples would, would proceed him to a town and would start the message out that, you know, Jesus is coming, you know, the Savior is coming, come meet the Savior, he'll be here in a couple hours. And, and they had a plan, they had a, a you know, a very direct focus of what a clear idea of what they wanted to do and uh, Jesus was not shy about this at all he he came into town and he preached the good news it says you know one of the first things in the gospel of Mark chapter 1 chapter 1 what did Jesus do after he was baptized repent for the kingdom of God is at hand and uh, so anyways <clears throat> Today's gospel was uh, uh, chapter six. Uh, and so he has uh, been kind of thrown out of his hometown. Uh, he went to his hometown and everybody recognized him as the son of Mary and the brother of all these people. And they've known him since he was in diapers and everything. So how can anything he says be uh, remarkable or godly? It's just they, they, we know this guy. Uh, and so, uh, but that didn't stop Jesus. That didn't stop him. He was right there. And he was not shy about telling the people what, what needed to happen. And so for me personally, the, uh, that's, that's the, the trick right there is I'm shy, basically I'm shy. And uh, it's hard for me to get in a person's face and share with them the gospel. It's, it's just not something I'm comfortable to do. It's the right thing to do. And the Don guy that Friday I was with uh, was very, very good at it. But also Jesus was not shy about going in and, and preaching the word and healing those who were sick and everything. But in his own hometown, he gets stood up, kind of. Uh, he, he goes into the synagogue and he reads from the scrolls and everybody is, is kind of saying, hey, don't we know this guy? And uh, it's, uh, it just all of a sudden, you know, Jesus is there trying to minister and it says he marveled at their unbelief. It's not that he enjoyed it, not that it was a good thing, but it was like, whoa, this is, and so it says in, in the, uh, Mark chapter six that he could do no, no great miracles there because of their unbelief. So there's one, one thing about that is that our belief and our tuning our ears to his voice has an impact on what happens with God. It absolutely does. So the second part of our gospel was the, he calls the 12, the disciples, and I don't know if they were saying, oh, that was a disaster. It's like that didn't, you know, I tried over here, I tried over there, and nothing happened. But I can imagine a conversation like that after being at the hometown of Jesus. And uh, so instead of worrying about it, Jesus says, okay, guys, 
I'm going to send you out two by two, and I'm going to give the authority that I have, and this is a key thing, the authority that I have, Jesus says, I'm going to give to you. So I'm going to send you out two by two. You're going to go out, and you're going to heal the sick. And, uh, and the disciples were like, okay, yeah. That, that Jesus, when he spoke to them, his voice carried such authority and such uh, such knowledge and such power that the disciples like lined up. So Jesus gives them their sort of marching orders and says, uh, no, so take your staff, don't take two tunics, uh, you know, take a little bit of food, not, not too much, forget about money. And so what he was saying there was, this is sort of your geographical region, a day's walk. And he, Jesus said to the disciples, so go ahead and do this, go out to these other villages and you do them. I've been doing it up, up until now. You go out and do the ministry. And uh, if you go into a village and you're accepted and given a place to stay, then go ahead and stay there. Don't, and also don't, the implication of that is don't, if somebody accepts you, but their house isn't grand and beautiful and luxurious, don't go shopping around for a better house. Go to that first place that accepts you. If they don't accept you, then shake the dust off your feet and, and leave that village. And, and it's kind of brutal there. Shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them and move on, basically. So uh, anyways, uh, just a remarkable thing. Uh, so the, the disciples go out and this is a new thing. They're doing ministry and they're doing it in the name of Jesus. But Jesus is back at, whether it's Capernaum Central or whatever, and they, the disciples, are going out. And so Jesus has given them their, their marching orders and said, go, and they are out there going. So they're praying for people. And they're kind of like Don was doing with us on Friday. They're evangelizing people. And they're, they're talking about the good news of Jesus Christ, and they're spreading the word. So in some cases, while we appreciate Acts chapter 2 as the beginning, of the church in a sense mark chapter 6 is also in in one sense the beginning of the church because jesus has commissioned these people and they go out and they spread the gospel and so <clears throat> anyways uh, it's, it's a beautiful success. So Mark chapter 6 begins with kind of a catastrophe or a disaster or, or no success and sort of a, a bad experience. And Jesus goes, changes what he's doing and sends them out and it's amazing success. And just in the blink of an eye, the authority and the power of Jesus on the people as an encouragement and as a uh, as a empowerment of the disciples to go out and minister, do what they're supposed to do. It also talks about um, about uh, him giving authority over unclean spirits. And so my personal experience of this was um, I grew up in either the Episcopal Church or the Presbyterian Church or the Congregational Church, so mainline Protestantism. And so the preaching that I heard as I was growing up was very good, talking about the stories of Jesus and about, uh, you know, the effect of the impact, uh, the impact of the church on the world, you know, today. Of course, it wasn't today. It was 50 years ago, 60 years ago. Anyways. And so that's what I grew up with. It wasn't so much about a personal relationship with Jesus. It was about sort of this good idea that we have about Christ and about God. And let's take this good idea. It's not so much the good news, it's the good idea. And uh, so uh, when I became a teenager, uh, in my particular family, my brothers had all gone on to prep school and then college. And then I went off to prep school and uh, it was, I went to an Episcopal prep school where, again, they kind of promoted this, you know, Jesus is the great good idea. Um, and uh, so it wasn't until years later uh, that I actually, in my particular case, my wife's case, came really face to face with uh, what I can only term as abject evil. And I cried out to Jesus for help. And I and Patrice, we were immediately, immediately rescued by the power of God. And it wasn't just Jesus, the good idea. It was like him. 
and he showed up when we needed him. Praise God. So we grew up in a generation of Jesus is a good idea. I grew up into adulthood and, and found that I needed all of Jesus, not just the good idea of Jesus. And so, uh, so the world, you know, since the 1950s, 1960s, growing up in that where America was successful and there, there was prosperity and uh, people, uh, you, get a, you go out, you work, you know, get a good education, in some cases an advanced degree, and you go out in the world, you make your place, you have a job, you have a career, and you can, uh, you can aspire to that improvement. Your life is better than the generations that precede you. And and uh, I think the gas is kind of running out on that picture, or is there's, it's being threatened, let's just say that. And so, um, in all of this, I had to confront the Jesus, the good idea, and compare it with Jesus, Lord, help me now, please. And I went with the Lord, help me now, please. And I'm, I've never regretted that choice, that, that, a, that Jesus not only is the great good idea, but he's also my Lord and Savior and my friend, and that he speaks to me his words of love and light, and he speaks to all of us those words of love and light, and uh, that it is through our choosing of his person, choosing of his love, and asking for his presence, that I am changed, and I am more and more able to function in, in this crazy world that we live in. And so uh, returning to Mark chapter 6, so the disciples have gone out, they've done their ministry, they've done these great things. And so the, this is, these are the results. They cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. And so uh, I was talking with our Bible study group about this, uh, my utmost for his highest. And there's a couple of quotes from them I want to share from that book, my utmost for his highest. So here's one quote that I'd like to share. Listen to this. God's grace turns out men and women with a strong family likeness to Jesus Christ. So the work of God in my life and in your life, he is making us, turning us into brothers and sisters. And that a little bit and a little way, we start looking like him and acting like him and talking like him and being like him. Not that I'm the savior or you're the savior, he's got that job, but that we're closely family relatives to him. And that's part of the work of God. So, uh, so I love the, the passage that we have from Paul in 2 Corinthians. He's talking about this experience. I know somebody uh, 14 years ago, well, in fact, he fesses up later on and says that he is the person that experienced this. 14 years ago, was caught up, up to the third heaven, caught up into paradise and heard things that are not to be told. And uh, so the, the key thing about that was that he experienced true bliss with the Lord Jesus Christ, Paul did, and that I think that we know that in the ministry of Jesus Christ, in the presence of Jesus Christ, that we too can be really caught up with him and experience the, the power and the love in heaven. And uh, even with all of our shortcomings, and uh, just watching back to Dartmouth uh, two days ago, watching Don just like in some cases chase these Dartmouth College students until he kind of got around in front of them and said, do you know if you died today or if you died yesterday, would you be in heaven today? And what courage that takes and what, uh, Com being completely convinced of how Jesus he is, that Don person doing that there. And so, uh, and you know, he, I don't know if he was successful or if his life was a mess or anything, this Don person I'm talking about, uh, but he was successful in evangelizing in a very difficult situation and uh, risked his uh, relationship with Jesus and risked himself to some degree. Uh, to evangelize in a what I would have called kind of the heart of darkness at the Dartmouth Center place Dartmouth College campus and so I'm, I'm beginning to understand last week I was talking about contentment and uh, how you know being at the beach it was easy to talk about contentment uh, but uh, 
Paul says in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 10, Therefore I am content with weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. So Paul, I think, was somebody who could like write from personal experience about that stuff for the sake of Christ. Continuing that quote, uh, I am content with weaknesses, insults, and etc. But he says, Paul says, whenever I am weak, then I am strong. Okay, how's the logic there? That, that doesn't make sense unless you understand the gospel paradox. That when I am weak, I am strong and I'm content with weakness because I've got me out of the way and Jesus can operate fully and completely through me. And so that's, that's the key thing meaningful to me is that when, when we do uh, turn weak, and we do have trepidation and concerns and problems and everything. It may not look like it, it may not feel like it, but in many ways we are as strong as we'll ever be because the power of Jesus Christ is working through us. So may we all be fully persuaded this, this day and all days about the, uh, not just the, the good idea of Jesus Christ, but about the person and the power of Jesus Christ standing right next to us when we do go through hard times, when we have challenges, when there are difficulties, or like Paul, uh, weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, those kinds of things, so that we can go ahead and risk a little bit on behalf of the kingdom. And that I pray that for me as well as all of us. In Jesus' precious name, amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you to make his face to shine upon you and give you his peace. Amen.